Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, what prompted this discussion was um, U Heights asking how we could help with the homelessness crisis. And I'm assuming that's why all of you are here tonight. So thank you. Um, we thought that the first step towards helping was learning and bringing together our neighbors to have a discussion to talk about solutions. But what we do know is that, according to the last point in time count, that there's a minimum of over 11,000 people who are homeless in our county. And we do know that, according to the last two counts, that somewhere between 2,100 and 3,300 minimum are living in their vehicles. And we also know that 200 people died because they were homeless last year, which is four times the number, um, or excuse me, double the number from four years ago. And so we are delighted to have this panel here who bring very diverse opinions and to the topic, as well as um, Arthur Padilla, who will be our moderator this evening. Arthur is the interim executive director at the Roots Youth Shelter. And he also has over 25 years experience working for social justice, particularly for youth around homelessness and around mental health. So thank you all for being here this evening. Well, thank you all for being here. It's great to see you. Lots of fun faces. I see some familiar faces of people I don't know. And um, so for the first half hour, I'm going to talk about myself. No. <laughs> uh, we could, because I could do that, but we're not going to do that. So um, my name is Arthur Bidia, and I am the interim at Roots um, Homeless Shelter, and we are right down the street. And this conversation is relevant to us because we have we see so many people come through our doors and we know the impact of homelessness. We, we live with it every day. So for me, this is really important. I am not gonna do a lot of talking. I'm gonna spend some time keeping you in order, keeping this group in order, and then we'll, we'll move along. And I'm not, um, an, and I will, um, I will uh, uh, possibly pop questions out if they come up. So we'll see how this all works. We might have a conversation. It depends on what happens, right? So let's kind of leave it open. I would just, I would, I would do two things. The th first thing I'd like to ask us is, in all of this craziness that is our life, um, we have a lot of interruptions and, there, and technology seems to get in the way. So I'm going to ask you all to just turn those phones off, turn them down so they don't ring, and just kind of reduce the distractions so we can have this conversation. And then the other thing that I think is really important in all of this is that we um, have this conversation with uh, the caveat that we're listening to learn and that we're learning to listen. And, and that is that we really are really uh, trying to um, hear what people are saying and not uh, create arguments and conversations in our head, really, because it's really important about how are we going to have this open conversation. So um, listening to learn and learning to listen. So let's try that for uh, as our mantra for tonight. And with that, I am not going to introduce you to, it, to the whole group. You are going to introduce yourselves to the whole group. But I have a couple of questions. I have a question with that. So um, please give us an overview of who you are and why you have chosen to participate in this conversation. And describe to us why you feel this conversation is important to the work of resolving homelessness. And whoever wants to start, start. I guess I'll start. Uh, my name is Graham Press. I am a, uh, let's see. Uh, I got into this work because I had experienced homelessness as a teenager briefly. Uh, I had uh, my son at a, a young age, and so I had uh, been on social services for many years, um, but was able to uh, trans, uh, kind of uh, transform a career into uh, ac academics here at the University of Washington, and uh, just finished up a, a doctorate in anthropology here studying vehicle residency. And so I've actually been doing research on this uh, topic for the last nine years. Uh, as part of that, I actually purchased an RV early on, uh, about nine years ago, in Ballard, and uh, had stayed on the streets looking at uh, how tickets were being applied and, and what was happening there. Um, I also worked as part of the safe parking programs and helped to start the, and work with those safe parking programs for two years here in Seattle. Worked with about 700 people uh, to help them get into housing in those programs. Uh, and then also was uh, served on the executive and governing board for All Home uh, to understand how this uh, sort of uh, issue works at the top level down as well. So um, I, I, that experience, I think, uh, helps me to understand this issue sort of from a nuts to bolts perspective, uh, which was my goal. And um, I think, do I, is there another question? Is that everything? Okay, great. That's me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Welcome everyone. I'm Josephine Ensign and I'm a professor of nursing uh, at the University of Washington. I'm a nurse practitioner 
and have worked um, exclusively with um, homeless uh, populations, uh, cradle, cradle to grave, um, focus on homeless teens for about 35 years. Mm. I'm also the soon to be outgoing director of the Doorway Project, which is TASC. It's a state funded um, project with youth care tasked with ending youth homelessness in the university district including our own university students that we uh, know all too well um, are overrepresented as well in terms of um, homelessness, including vehicle residency. I um, also have the lived experience of homelessness, including uh, for about six months in my car. It was a long time ago, um, and it was in a different city. It was in my hometown of Richmond, Virginia. Um, so I know this uh, from direct experience. I've worked with many, many um, teens um, and also women who uh, purposely choose to live in their vehicles because of safety issues. Uh, a lot of uh, previous you know, childhood sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, and it's a very real thing, very visceral. So I am passionate about this topic. I'm also a homeowner. I've raised a family here. I'm now raising, helping to raise a granddaughter. I care passionately about Seattle and our history of trying to do the right thing um, by each other, and that includes our, our homeless um, citizens. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Hi everyone, my name is Tyresha Jenkins. Um, I'm 23 years old and I currently work within intertwining communities, um, all helping and supporting homeless youth, um, youth development, and also the art communities. And I'm really passionate about being here tonight because I'm pretty much using my life as a platform to be picked at, prodded, ask any questions. It's what I've learned most about my work, especially during my time in college, um, I worked at, I also should mention, I worked at Roots for four years. So coming from lived experience, coming from working in social services, and also coming with a very strong indigenous perspective and lens on life, I'm learning about and hoping to teach um, what it means to intertwine and bring into the conversation identities what we go through in our daily lives and how to connect this to the homeless conversation and really understand that the homeless community is our community. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good to see, oh, good to see all of you here. Um, familiar faces and new faces. Maybe I should use this one. That one. Is that, that sounds better, okay. Yes, thanks. Um, I'm Bill Curlin Hackett. I direct the Interfaith Task Force on Homelessness. Uh, I think in a way I'm also here representing many of the congregations who've helped start homeless ministries. Places like DESC started out of the faith community and many others, uh, Plymouth Housing. And uh, we owe a lot to those many pioneers in the faith community. We started in 2001 and in 2004 I became director and our main goal was education and advocacy. We did workshops that each year that brought hundreds of people together and had great speakers. Uh, but around 2009, 2010, around the time this young man started down there, um, we noticed that the system, which we spent a lot of time in the system, I helped write the 10-year plan, I went to all their meetings, as, and this young person here also helped write that and organize it, so it's good to see you. But um, we began to see that there was really no direct work happening around vehicles, and there was a lot of harm happening. And in 2011, the council wanted to capture $25 million in outstanding parking fines from all of you good people. If you're homeless, probably not you, but uh, otherwise, we weren't paying our tickets. But they didn't include any remedy or mitigation for those living in vehicles, and at that point, it was becoming very evident. So we started the Seattle Mitigation, Scofflaw Mitigation Project, and we work with parking enforcement very cooperatively and with the municipal court, so that we're really almost able to say that in those years since we started, 2011, no one really lost their vehicle who didn't get it back if they had erroneously towed it. Now, that's a giant Band-Aid on a broken system, and we continue to work on that, but that's 
Alongside of that, we worked on getting safe parking started with the Road to Housing program. We've worked on helping, and I was living in Linwood, so I helped Edmonds Unitarian and others start programs in Snohomish County, St. John the Baptist in Covington, uh, Kent United Methodist, Lake Washington United Methodist, which has the most vehicles of anybody, all safe parking programs out of faith communities because we have laws from the federal government that allow faith communities to start things easier, and thankfully in Seattle, it is really easy because of Mayor McGinn and his staff um, really pushed that. And that includes tent encampments and small houses and other projects like that. So uh, I continue to stay involved, and each year I go, is it time to stop doing this? And uh, I need a replacement. Would one of you volunteer tonight? <laughs> So thank you for coming, and uh, this is a long conversation. Uh, I'll just finish the new system that's coming in, the regional authority. will need a lot of voices to cover all these gaps. Um, you should start getting informed. There's a web page. You can link off of the allhomekc.org page and find it. Find out what they're doing. Uh, the council members will be passing an interlocal agreement soon. Uh, we need all the other cities in the county to do this. On paper, it looks great. It hopefully will include addressing vehicles. Because uh, last year, we had more than half of the unsheltered living in vehicles. And this year, the number went way down. And statistically, I am very skeptical. But we know it's a problem. Uh, you see it. So uh, safe parking's one of the options. And it's a courageous thing to do. Uh, well, good evening. My name is Teresa Mosqueda. I'm Seattle City Council member citywide. I'm in position eight. I got elected in 2017. And for anybody who was in this room, it was a very hot day that we had a debate right over there. I um, appreciate the opportunity to come back. And I want to say thank you to University Heights, U Heights, and to Roots um, for hosting this event. Um, and to all of you for being here. What really makes me excited about being part of this discussion is I look around and I see a lot of people who've come to City Hall before who have met with us in our offices and also right here in community to talk about solutions. The reason I'm excited about this conversation is I believe we're all interested in finding solutions and helping to be part of the network to help solve the crisis. A little bit of the reason that I think we're all interested in solving crisis is because we see this as a public health issue. My background is in public health. I used to work for the Department of Health, Community Health Plan in Washington. I work for Children's Alliance, fighting for health care for all kiddos. And then at the State Labor Council, fighting for health care for everyone. If you don't have a home, it is very hard to be healthy. If you don't have your health, it's hard to keep your home and your job. And so for me, this is directly related to the health of the individuals who are sleeping outside and sleeping in their cars. It's directly related to the health and the psyche and the population health of our community. When we see people sleeping outside, even if we're housed and we're driving to work or we're riding on the bus and we see people sleeping outside and we know that it's hard for them to be sleeping outside, perhaps needing access to counseling, perhaps needing access to health services, and most importantly, access to a safe place to call home, that hurts us as well as those in the community who see that. And it's really bad for the health of our local economy. We've spent a lot of time talking about how Seattle's a growing city. People want to come here. They're coming here for good living wage jobs. They're coming here to start businesses. They're coming here to seek refuge from extreme climate in other parts of the country. And they're coming here as immigrants and refugees because we say we're a welcoming city. But we haven't yet built the housing that we need to welcome the 20% population growth that we've seen over the last 10 years. That's 114,000 people who've come to our city since 2010. And we haven't kept up with the housing demand. So I see these issues interlinked. And I see the core of them being direct, directly connected to the health of individuals, our population, and the health of the local economy. I'm also really excited to be here to talk about that family element, because we know it's really hard to get back on your feet if you're being separated from your family. And a lot of us think about the crisis on the border and people being separated. One of the reasons that individuals don't go out of their car and into shelters is because in some of our shelters, you get separated from your loved one. Your kiddo can't stay with you, or you can't stay with your husband or your wife of the opposite sex. And sometimes sleeping in your car is one of the only ways to keep your family together. That's a critical element to think about why people are sleeping inside. 
And we have to offer them our alternatives to sleeping in their car. We have to offer them uh, enhanced shelters, meaning a place where people can stay together with their loved ones and keep their belongings. Often they're sleeping in their cars because it's the only place that they can keep their last belongings. So the alternatives to sleeping in their car are something we have got to work on as a city. And even if they are in a shelter, even an enhanced shelter where you can have a case manager and have a shower and have a locker and stay with your loved one, you're still homeless, right? So the solution to homelessness is housing. Immediately, we need more uh, enhanced shelters. And in the meantime, as we build those, as we open more and hopefully protect places like Roots from getting shut down, we have got to recognize that, that one of the more public health like approaches to helping to serve those who are currently homeless is to recognize that when they're sleeping in their car, this is the last place of refuge for them to be with their family, to keep their belongings, and to be safe, as was mentioned. I don't see this as a long-term solution by any means, but I'm really excited to talk with you all because I think we're all interested in those short, medium, and long-term solutions, and that's part of the conversation we'll have tonight, so I look forward to hearing from you. I, I, this is the part where I feel like I get to say ditto. <laughs> uh, so my name is no, you can't. <laughs> my name is Abel Pacheco. I'm the city council member for District Four. Uh, I've been in the position now for the last four months, and I will be in this position for another four months. Uh, and with that, I take the responsibility of understanding that the city has had so many conversations uh, and done so much work, and so really. Uh, Councilmember Mosqueda has been a leader in a lot of these issues, and how do I keep advancing that agenda forward? Um, Councilmember Mosqueda, one of the things she said uh, when um, during the appointment process was, so much of our lived experiences help inform and drive our passions and our decision making process. So for me, uh, you know, I think about my mother when my mother was uh, she was a victim of domestic violence, uh, and all the time does she kind of try to find ways for us to be safe. Um, you know, how, where were we? Uh, where did we try to find uh, temporary shelter when, wherever we could with family or, or with friends? My father, uh, after th my parents divorced, my father would actually, sometimes on the weekends, uh, we would sleep with him in the car in his uh, B2000 Mazda, uh, and I still remember the back on the camper. Um, fast forward, uh, one time when I was visiting my mother, uh, she, one of her neighbors next door, a uh, senior citizen, um, just immediately left uh, the building. And uh, my mother tells me the story that she finds her uh, sleeping in her car uh, a block away. And my mom invites her inside the house and provides a shelter for the night. So the, the reason why I say and mention all this is because all of us in the pathways to homelessness are much more complex and nuanced than any of us, than, than really, then, uh, then as policymakers, um, we have to really just take in consideration of really being all hands on deck about all the different solutions that are necessary to uh, in help do what we can uh, and ensure that we can provide stability to so many individuals and families in crisis. Um, now, for me personally, you know, I, I volunteer uh, because of I, you know, I believe that I, I have privilege, and because of that privilege, uh, as an able body uh, person, I. I I can do what I can to try to do uh, volunteer or be of service to my community. Um, and so that's what really what drives me and my passions, my work. Um, and I try to encourage other young people to get engaged, get involved, and do what they can as well. So that, and then all of, all of us in this room can do what we can to, to help improve the lives and outcomes uh, for anyone that's in crisis or in need. Thank you all for sharing that. I think it's really important to note um, the uh, lived experience that's sitting on the panel. I think that's really always a valuable. So I, I thank you for all for sharing that. So um, before we move on, there was a young man that was supposed to join us, Vince, and he um, was able to write a statement that I'm going to read, and then we'll start the process. So Vince is a resident of Denny Park's apartment, a Lehigh affordable housing building, who used to live in his vehicle. He was planning to be here tonight to share his story, but was called into work and he wanted us to share his statement. Hello everyone, my name is Vince. I was living in my car at the beginning of April this year. Work hours had become slow and I had a car payment due along with rent. I had to make a choice whether to make a payment on my car or put the money towards the roof over my head. And at the time, I decided to make a payment on the car because that's what got me to work. I then started sleeping in my car and couldn't figure out how I was gonna get back on my feet. 
I was grateful to be in my car during the rainy nights. It was very uncomfortable and something I hope not to experience again. One day I reached, uh, one day I reached to Miss Krishna Richardson Daniels from the Wood Tech Center. When I mentioned about my homelessness, she immediately reassured me that it will be fine. A few hours later, I, I, I got a call to meet with Shelby from True Hope Village. I then met with the staff and I was given a key to a tiny home, which by the way, I was not expecting at all. I was at True Hope for about 29 days when I was told that they had found me an apartment. I was thinking, I've heard this before, and I thought this was informed, and I thought this as I was informed by Miss Shelby and Miss LaDonna that I was, and, and I will be receiving a phone call from Miss Ashley at Lehigh. I got the call and the process was so quick. I now live at Denny Park Apartments and it's been a blessing to live there. Without the great commitment and communication with these ladies, I would not have a place to live, to be living in, and thank you so much. So I think it's important to note that that, that, that voice, that his voice is here, and let's kind of hold that in that space as we continue this conversation, and that's really important. So the next question I have for you, and it kind of, it lends to kind of what you've already um, brought up, and by the way, it should have pr prompted some questions, so I want to see some questions being written down. As policymakers and influencers, what would you do to fix the situation, and how relevant is it to provide parking as a solution? And the situation being homelessness, by the way. So, um, so one of the things that I found in this research uh, that I thought was was interesting, and, it, and it's it's echoed by just about everybody uh, on this panel so far, is that um, so many of the people that I had met who live in their vehicles uh, are using their vehicles as affordable affordable housing, and that these are um, so many people are are people who have had to choose between, as you mentioned in the story, you know, uh, the the car payment or their home, and using the vehicle to to work. It may be the last the vehicle may be the last major possession that they're holding on to when they lost their housing. It may actually be a, a way that's a step off the street. But one of the really interesting things is that for vi many many people who are living in their vehicles, they don't don't see themselves as homeless at all. They see themselves as having a home, that their vehicle is a home, and that a lot of the problem really is, is that there it just isn't this parking space that you mentioned. And, and that's why, really, what's really lacking here. Um, you know, the, uh, since uh, 2008, uh, vehicle residency has represented 30% of people who've been unsheltered. So this isn't a new number. This is something that's been going on for quite some time. But really, it's been for the last couple of years that those numbers have risen. And, and part of it's due to improved counting methods, but part of it's also just due to more and more people who are living on the streets who are living in their vehicles. And, and what we see is, is that Right now, you know, uh, in 2018, there were, I think, 3,300 people who were documented as living in their vehicles across King County, and that was a minimum. Uh, that, you know, the reality was there really wasn't the parking spaces for really just about any of those people, very few at least. And so without that parking space for that person to exit the street, there's really no exit from the situation at all. And that's for the community, that's for the business owners, that's for the property owners, and for the person in their vehicle. And what we see, what's really kind of fascinating is that Everybody in, in that, those groups I just mentioned are sort of aligned around that same idea. These are people who don't necessarily want to live in that public parking space, but there isn't a place for them to park their home. And so without that place to park their home to actually connect into the systems that provide housing, long-term housing, we can't use their immediate possession that they own now, their actual piece of property that they see as home, their primary shelter. We can't use that as something that we can leverage into permanent housing. But if we have a space for that vehicle to actually park off the street, we can do that. We can actually start to use that property as a way that isn't an anchor around someone's neck, but it is actually something that's beneficial that can be that, that, that stepping stone between uh, being living in a, a, a parking space on the street and actually getting into permanent housing. So the, uh, the need for parking space in our system, I, I think that honestly what the solution we need to look at, and this may sound radical, but we need to have a, a full system-wide integration of parking spaces into our shelter models. Because we have, as we know, I mean, uh, up to half of the people who are living on the streets of Seattle are living in their vehicles, and if we really want to address homelessness, if we want, on, want to end homelessness for all, then we need to address that half of those people as well. So, I, so what I'm talking about is not some new thing to give these per the, uh, this group a, a privileged advantage, but really to include them in the systems of care that we provide for all of our neighbors. Yeah, and um, I would just add to that, yes. Um, uh, and 
until his book comes out, which I really <laughs> highly recommend that you read once he uh, finishes his dissertation and has his book it's coming out from uh, University of Washington Press. If you haven't read it already, and I don't get any kickback from this, <laughs> but it is uh, Jessica uh, Brar's um, Nomad Land that came out a couple of years ago. It's excellent. It does not focus on Seattle. Are you um, um, yeah, I should be, shouldn't I? Uh, but it, it echoes a lot of, of what Graham's just saying, is that um, and, and she's highlighting a very mobile, they call themselves the rubber tramps, and kind of going back to our original tramp scare, which happened in the late um, 18th century, and then really took off, well, took off after the Civil War because of PTSD, um, actually. Um, and, and she talks about how so many people, like living in our, in our um, national parks, going around to where the jobs are, including like Amazon warehouses, that they really do not um, consider themselves homeless. And then reflecting on that, um, there, there's one woman in the book who says that, that she's realizing as she's saying that, that she herself is looking down on those homeless people. Um, but it really um, problematizes the, the issue of vehicle res residency and also puts it within a national and a current, current event um, uh, perspective, which I think is important. One thing I do want to say, because um, I'm uh, looking at the history of homelessness and healthcare um, in King County from the very beginning, our very first Homeless, official homeless, uh, insane pauper was Edward Moore back in 1856, found on a beach um, in Belltown. Um, I do want to just mention that Seattle has this amazing, even though we're, we're considered kind of unchurched, you know, we have like some of the, uh, have, have traditionally not had super high um, membership in churches. At the same time, the churches have had outsized, uh, outsized um, impact on social justice issues in our town. Um, Plymouth, I mean, lots and lots of congregations. And the other thing is just like looking at this from a, a historical perspective and a kind of a higher level thing, and I echo the public health um, perspective, that's my, my terminal degree is, uh, is international health. And that is, why does Seattle, we, we, we are known worldwide as being very innovative mm -hmm. in a lot of our uh, social justice and public health interventions, including like the 1811 building. Where we fall down is we, we, we don't scale them up. For some reason, they just don't catch on. They catch on in other parts of the world. I was in Edinburgh um, this past fall, and, and people are adopting the 1811 bill. I mean, they're asking me about it and saying, well, aren't there like more of them in Seattle? And I'm like, no, you know, it's fighting back. So it's just something for us to think about is, what is it about our, potentially our over-processing um, mm -hmm. and debating things to death? Um, where we don't take a really good idea that um, actually has the facts behind it in terms of being a good public health um, intervention, why don't we like take that to scale and get past all of the myriad conversations about it? So can I ask a follow-up question real quick? So you're talking about a, um, a, a good public health intervention. Can you describe someone what that means in terms of this particular initiative? Why is this a good public health intervention? Why is this relevant? Well, I think and if, if any of you did not read the Seattle Times article today on vehicle residency, I encourage you um, to read it. Yes, and um, the person I'm representing here is, is quoted in it as well. And that is, uh, again, coming from a public health perspective um, and from a harm reduction perspective that this exists and for a reason because it is um, uh, you know, basically low-income housing and people have a say um, to a certain extent over where, where, they're, where they're staying. Um, but, but it is a public health issue in terms of sanitation, in terms of safety for overdose deaths, in terms of fire, um, these kinds of issues. I mean, we had that you know, back in the Depression with Hooverville um, as well. So of taking those into consideration, but working with um, people with the current lived experience because they're the experts. And so oftentimes we leave that out. Um, we don't have people work, 
my perspective. We don't have enough people in policy, in, uh, in, <laughs> in, uh, in public um, positions who, who have the lived experience and who are open with that and have that inform what they're saying. But we definitely do not actually say to people who are having whatever these experiences are, you're the experts in what's going on for you. Let's actually you know, hear from you about what works and what would be good for you at the same time. Anybody else? So, um, let's, let's give some. Yeah, let's go for it. I just want to add to that a little bit. Um, so. Public health, we're wonky. We like wonky policy sauce and we spread it all over everything. <laughs> and we want data-driven solutions, right? That's what I think of when I think of public health, data-driven solutions. So from my perspective, when I think uh, you asked about uh, you know, how is a safe lot a public health intervention? How is it a harm reduction intervention? Um, one really great example of this is in public health, you want to meet people where they're at. If you want people to eat healthier food, you try to get them healthier food in their local grocery store and not not just shame people when they come to the doctor and say you got to eat better. If you want people in um, in communities to get more exercise instead of saying join a gym, what we do in public health is we try to make more walkable communities, more sidewalks, more safe routes to school. That's what I did when I was at public health. If we want to meet people where they're at in terms of treating folks in uh, the crisis of homelessness, we know from ongoing conversations and because of data-driven reports that the best way to help folks get inside and get housed is to know where they are at. When people are sleeping outside and they're sleeping in a tent, like the people that I bike by every day um, along the railroad track down there on East Marginal Way, and let's say one day they're there and the next day they're moved, right, because it's not a safe place to be sleeping by the railroad tracks and there's a lot of you know public health concerns with folks sleeping around there. When they're moved, the folks that have been working with them, let's say from youth care or their case manager, they come to try to tell them, guess what? We got you a place to live and they show up and that tent's not there. I've heard folks at youth care and other places like Mary's Place say that they've been working to get people in housing for months if, um, and they built relationships and they know them and they've created this trust and they come in and they say, guess what? We got you your health card. Here's the health card and they show up and their tent's not there anymore. One of the really important things about having a safe place to stay at night is to know that your case manager and the folks who've been working with you to get you health care, to get you housing, and sometimes a job, know where to find you um, so that you're not constantly moved and you're not having to deal with the trauma of also being moved, but that we know where you're at and we're going to treat you where you're at in a safe place. That's a really important element for us helping to stabilize folks and get them inside. And one of the reasons that I just said, in case they need a job, it's important to remember that here in Seattle, what we've seen in time and time again with our data, with our reports, is that somewhere between 20 to 40 percent of our homeless population has employment. It might be part-time, it might be seasonal, it might be um, temporary, but what they don't have is a place to call home and a place to take a shower so that they can keep their job. So one of the really, more, really important things for us to do from that public health intervention model is to know where we can serve folks, know where we can treat folks, and then know where we can help find them when those houses, the units are open that many of our nonprofit organizations and city are working on. Again, this is not a solution, just like the ban mandate approach is not the solution to a broken uh, leg or a broken system, but these little ways in which we're treating folks and helping to stabilize them help with the public health model of treating people where they're at and not having to reinvent the wheel every time and chase people around. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not only good for the health of those individuals, but it's fiscally wise as well. The folks at Youth Care and Mary's Place and others have talked about how much time they waste trying to find those people that they've built relationships with when they've moved, been moved from corner to corner. It is more effective and efficient and a more humane way for us to help make sure that people can get off the street if we know where they're at and can help treat them on site and then most importantly, get them into housing. Anybody else want to comment before you do? Oh, yes. I'll, I'll leave you for last. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, that's right. Yeah. From the lens of, um, a former social provider or social services provider, I would like to see change in, in providers working in isolation. Um, homelessness is a system that we all can identify, um, but the solutions and these, all of these great innovations often take off in isolation. But there's 
always a history of someone who's done it before or tried these ideas before. Um, so from that lens, I would like to see us, before taking action, really doing the research and finding where other providers and advocates are before we come into the communities. And that's, my, that's when I see long-term goals. I still feel that um, short-term solutions, such as vehicle residency, are very important. Anything that addresses the immediate safety needs of um, homeless families, homeless individuals, like I was myself. This is where I can switch the lens to my experience. Last summer, I remember walking hot days all day long, and then mostly just spending my time by the water because I didn't have the money to publicly occupy any stationary space, and I didn't have a vehicle. So I could only imagine, and I was carrying my bags. I also witnessed many mothers with strollers who were in the same situation. So getting in the lens of, yes, Homelessness as an individual or a family, there are things to see and identify there, but also as a community, what policies are already in place that prohibit people from feeling safe to even walk the streets? Mm -hmm. um, there, there's constant stresses and pressures that come with that, so thinking about that. Um, I think vehicle residency is really important because it's, it keeps us safe. Um, I, I have not experienced so much violence, physical violence, more than I had during my time of homelessness. And that was just six months. Mm -hmm. And I feel like my time was only amount of six months because I had worked at Roots, I had been to college, I had done all of these things before becoming homeless. So I had a pre-plan of, ooh, I gotta get out of this domestic violence situation, let me go back to where I work, and then I know I can work my way out from there. Most people don't come with that knowledge. Um, and so when we talk about community, I think it's, it's, it would be so pivotal to have that space, especially at somewhere like U Heights, that's already known and historically rooted. Mm. Um, and so from short term to long term, short term, we're, getting, we're providing that, necessary, that, ne that immediate safety. Long term, using that time to get to know the families and talk and build that trust and vulnerability to talk about those issues that create the system of homelessness as a whole because it's all broken down into different facets. There's, all, there's many different identities and there's sections that are working together. And I think the more that we are able to be occupied the same spaces as providers and those experiencing it, we can get down to the root of, okay, where are we seeing it show up in our own lives and how can we reflect a better environment for everyone? Thank you, thanks. I wanna yeah, also address the um, policymakers and solutions. Um, thank you for mentioning short, mid, and long term. We've had that list out for a long time. It's not exhaustive, but we have to start somewhere on short term. And the system seems a little resistant to that. Um, uh, the thing I say a lot lately is it's not a menu, it's a recipe. We have a lot of task forces that pick two or three things off a list of 30 or cho 40 choices, thinking we're gonna change it for the better. Sometimes we change it for the worst. So we have to get out of the habit of having task forces that make recommendations and have it selected off like it's a menu. We need all the recipe parts. Um, three, uh, too much space is off limits. Uh, that goes for tents and vehicles. And I mean public and private space. We have enough space in Seattle to do an adequate job of housing the vehicles we have right now and begin to provide outreach. But as you've mentioned, we don't know where they are half the time because they have to move every 72 hours. Um, fourth, uh, align laws regionally. We have cities that make it illegal to sleep in your car overnight on a public right of way. But we won't enforce that law because we don't have enough shelter to send them to. So officers, who we work well with in this city, are now at risk of having to make a moral decision in these other cities. Everybody needs to have aligned laws around this vehicle issue. Um, and we need the vehicles because we don't have enough shelter. You know, uh, Graham has, is right that this is shelter for many people. Um, we do want healthy shelter, though. Um, I know there's a, something from the mayor about getting rid of the um, really unhealthy ones, and uh, I'm okay with that, but I think I've likened it to opening the door to the emergency room for a bleeding patient that you just let in. It's hardly enough to do that. Um, Let's see, uh, five, innovative and collaborative. We have not been innovative, we have not been collaborative. And I mean that both within Seattle and regionally. And then last, it's about the people. Uh, too much of the conversation that I'm hearing lately is always about the vehicles, or the unsightly vehicles, or where they're parked, and then, or we're gonna take the vehicles. Where are the people going? 
we just do not have outreach to the people right now. We are not creating what HUD used to call the pathway to stability. The people are really what matter. And we, we need to get our eyes back on the prize. And I just wanted to touch on the, uh, the public health issue too, uh, but, um, and, and as well as echo, uh, particularly council, uh, council person, what you had said. The, um, one of the, the primary issues that I saw uh, in, in the years when I was doing outreach was exactly what you talked about in that we would go out to do outreach to someone to tell them that we got you into a place or got you in a parking space and the whole group of people would be removed and it, it made it so difficult to do it and working with parking enforcement, often parking enforcement officers are stuck in a rock and a hard place because they don't want to do that work and they know they're hurting people but they, they have a job to do and they don't want to lose their jobs. And the reality is, is when, it, when we come to, to there's two things I, I haven't heard mentioned about public health um, and one of them is, is really important. I don't think we can't wear rose colored glasses about this. We have to be honest. There's dumping. There's garbage, there is deconstruction of items that are often done for scrapping. Um, all of these things are done because they're ways that people produce capital. They're ways that people are producing money so that they can survive. They're, they're forms of income, they're ways that they create connections with other people within their community. But all of these are on, be done because again, the vehicle is parked in this public space. There is no other place for this vehicle, and there's no garbage can generally next to that vehicle. So you see this large accumulating mass of, of objects, which, is, which you could kind of expect with any human settlement, right? You're going to get kind of everything that we all make in our houses because these are houses, these are homes. And it gets to the second piece about the, the public health thing that I, I think is really, really important, we often overlook, is that many people who are living in their vehicles um, one of the only other books that's, that's been written about this issue uh, talks about an idea of shelterization. And it says that vehicle residency is a way to resist shelterization, that there's this idea of sort of funneling everybody into shelters. And, and, that, and that kind of resonates, I think, with people who've done this work. But one of the interesting things about people living in vehicles is that for many people, there are parts of pop subpopulations that don't have a place in shelters. So again, it's the family who has the, the adult, the male that's over the age of 13. It might be somebody who's 85 years old and in terminal hospice, right? They might be dying of cancer, and there's no place for that person really in the shelter system, right? And so the problem is, is that we have these large numbers of people who really don't have a fit within the current emergency and, and housing system, and so because of it, there really is no way in. So they're seeing this vehicle as their optimum form of shelter because it is the only form of shelter, right? They're, they're, they, they can't afford the housing, they don't have the permanent income to get into it, and honestly, because there isn't an actual space in the shelter system, they're not even really being funneled into that anyway because there's not a spot for them there. And that's a really important uh, public health piece. Thank you. So I, I uh, went to graduate school for public affairs, and we used to say the same thing uh, in public affairs, which was meet people where they are. Um, and you know, this, this solution to homelessness, is, it's in the name, more homes. Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to focus, at least in my short time, is what can, because I heard a conversation about as policymakers, we get caught in this process, in the Seattle process, uh, is removing those barriers in terms of what we can do to expedite that, that process. Um, and the capacity of that and the time that I have. Um, because I do think one of the things that's happened is that we raise the temperature around the conversation of homelessness and I see this contention and, and what I'm trying and I really hope and I try to amplify is, is, you know, the process, yes, we need it, but we also need to be able to move a little quicker about those solutions uh, with regards to what we can do individually and collectively. Um, we know this, you know, Santa Barbara has a similar approach to setting up small groups of decentralized parking spots with case management. Uh, someone has done it. Uh, we can learn from it uh, if there are needs for improvement. And so for me, you know, it's, it's a really simple solution um, to recognizing and co being cognizant of the fact that as a city, we only have on any given night, I was get, received a report about 13 open beds, uh, shelter beds a night. That is just being cognizant and aware of the fact that we don't have enough space. We, don't, we haven't created enough space for folks who are, are in crisis. So, um, you know, I, I want to continue the conversation, but I'll leave it there. One more piece. No, no, go right um, ahead. Councilmember Pacheco is right on, and this is something that we have been working on in his time on council, and something that I've been working on for the last eight months. I think that we, as public policymakers, have not done a good job of saying what has worked and what we could do better. Identifying the areas where we know we can invest more, or that we've invested and we've shown to be working, but what we really need to do is scale up. 
Um, what I want is a dashboard that we can show you each month. How are we doing? How many people have we served? How many open beds were there a night versus how many people were sleeping outside? That is basic data that we should be able to access as public policymakers, that you all should be able to access as the public to know where those dollars are going. And frankly, so that we can share that with the press who's constantly asking us those questions. I am very frustrated by the lack of a dashboard or a monthly metric system that we can share with you. So we've been asking for this information. The request to have the number of beds open on an average night has been something I've been asking for for eight months. And Abel's correct that last month we saw a report that said on average night there was only 13 beds open. But I want to put a caveat on that. Only five to six of those beds were in the enhanced shelter model that we're talking about where people actually really feel safer, where they have a case manager, where they have a locker and they're not being asked to pick up their stuff at 6 in the morning and line up again at 6 p.m., where they're not being separated from their loved ones, from their kiddos, from their spouse, and they're allowed to stay together. The difference between an enhanced shelter is that it has the case manager, the bathroom, the shower, the locker, versus the basic shelter, which is a mat on the floor, roll out your mat in the middle of the night, roll it up early in the morning, it's no wonder that people feel like they can't get stabilized with that kind of basic shelter. But combined, 13 beds on average a night. Of the enhanced shelters, there's only five to six beds. Five to six beds. And how many people do we have sleeping unsheltered a night? Around 5,500. So the math, once we see those numbers and the stark comparison between how many people are outside versus how many enhanced shelter beds that we have, or just even mats on the ground, it is no wonder that we see so many people continuing to live outside. And I promise you, I know Abel is gonna be working on this with us as well. We're going to keep asking for that data to better paint a picture of what the need is, where we're doing well, because we know when we get people in that enhanced shelter bed, they are five times more likely to get housed than if they were just on a mat on the floor. We know the data, as you said, shows that those enhanced shelter shelters models people get stabilized faster. So we have to end the cycle of people getting kicked out onto the street because they're not getting stabilized and then also do the math to see that right now with our current system, we can't possibly shelter all those folks who are sleeping outside. Okay, excellent, thank you so much. Now we're, we're right on the first uh, close of our first hour. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just by a show of hands, do we have a lot of questions that have come up? Okay, so we do have some questions, great. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll take a few minutes to, to uh, break and then we'll come back um, and finish that up. So the question I have is, um, now that we've talked a little bit about this and we've kind of um, seen some of the uh, perspectives from the different panelists, what would you like the solution to be? What do you want, if it was up to you and you were grand poobah of the world and it was your turn to say this is what's gonna happen, what would that solution be, anybody? Uh, more homes, um, and, and more, more homes, but more, more case management. Again, you know, when I, when I started this conversation, I talked about just the different paths and, and just the, the, the difficulties and the nuances of life. Um, and that in itself, I think, is, is something that we have to be mindful of and, um, you know, trying to meet people where they are. I mean, whether that's, you know, escaping a, a, a situation that's, that's not healthy, uh, being a recent divorcee uh, or being a senior citizen who's on a fixed income and uh, finds himself, uh, you know, without a bed, you know, the, how, the paths to homelessness are, are very nuanced. And someone once said to me, you know, each one of us uh, are closer to living outside than we are living in Bill Gates. Um, so with that said, um, you know, more homes. Um, ag agreed. Uh, and it's not just Abel and I who are saying these items. Um, the Chamber of Commerce had a report that came out uh, uh, late last year, or I should say, no, I'm sorry, early 2018, and it said in the region, the total calculation of the dollars that we need in King County is $410 million a year. 
And then it went on to say, we need $205 million just in the city of Seattle to build the number of houses that we know we need for the lowest income and, and low wage working families. That's a significant amount of money. So we have to recognize that the dollar amounts, not just from my calculation or yours, um, according to the Chamber's own report, we do not have the dollars in hand right now to build the housing that we need. As we work on trying to find greater efficiencies, which we're going to do with our partners at King County and create this regional approach to homelessness, um, that task force, that group, is going to, it's, it's not a task force, I shouldn't say that, Lord have mercy, we're not going to create another task force. Uh, we are going to create a cross-governmental entity, a public development authority that will actually be looking at how we coordinate policies, how we coordinate revenue, and how we make sure that the very organizations that are serving homeless folks aren't having to jump through hoop after hoop and then repeat that again with our county. So that's going to help. But that alone, in terms of those efficiencies, is not going to solve the crisis. As we get additional dollars in hand and work with our state partners for additional funds, uh, we re have to recognize that the vast majority should be going into building housing, as the Chamber of Commerce's report said. But in the meantime, we also need to build those enhanced shelters and couple it with health services. Not everybody who is homeless needs mental health counseling or substance abuse counseling, right? 20 to 40 percent of folks have a job, but sometimes people who've been homeless for so long end up self-medicating. And so we also have to recognize that as we build housing, we need those case managers to help stably house folks and the health services, whether it's counseling or other services, to go with it. But the vast majority of our funds, and I would suggest um, around 80 percent is what we had originally calculated, the money should really be going into the building of the housing. Because right here in our city, we know this area is expensive. I've lived here for, I'm now 39. I've, I've been in Seattle for over 30 years, right? I grew up in Olympia. We know Seattle's always kind have been a little bit more expensive. In 2012, we were about 35% above the national average when it came to the cost of housing. Right now, six years later, we're at 113% over the national average. And we have seen the consequence of that lack of affordable housing in terms of people getting pushed into the street and also pushed out of our city. Um, not being able to afford their homes, frankly, sometimes, because a lot of the revenue comes from property taxes. So our, our seniors, our families who are living on the margin on fixed incomes, it's really hard to keep your home sometimes when that's the only revenue source that we're looking at. So one of the things we have to do is build more housing, both middle income and low income housing, with an emphasis on the capital construction for our lowest income, and at the same time, to also invest in health services and those enhanced shelters. That's, that's the, the goal. Uh. I think we're in year four, could be five, of a state of emergency. Um, this is the least known fact about, I mean, I can't think of another state of emergency that hasn't looked like a state of emergency than this one. Because if we had an earthquake or a tornado, I mean, we would be doing a lot that we're not doing here. And that means we need the innovation and collaboration. All the items have to be on the table for a while. We need, we need to be able to persuade people who feel very like Seattle's their home, that maybe there's another place nearby that will provide better safety for you. So we need a lot of what we call um, Craig Rennebaum's program of companionship. We need people to walk with others and say, well, let's try this out living over in, uh, let's say, Renton, you know, and get used to the neighborhood and get, you know, People won't go, I think one of you mentioned, the isolation factor is enormous of being homeless, and the loneliness is enormous. And the friends you make aren't always the best friends, but you make them because you're lonely. So we need better engagement from the general public, and we need that led by those who are elected and other uh, directors um, who can use some of their volunteers. Uh, but we're not acting like this as a state of emergency. And, and it is. I mean, I spend enough time around people who are at risk uh, to see it with my own two eyes. And I haven't lived it, but I am in the midst of the lived experience often enough that we should be ashamed of ourselves. You know, and I say that both as clergy and as a human being. We should just be ashamed of ourselves for letting this exist. And I know people don't want this to exist, but if we start saying it's a state of emergency, what are we gonna do? We might actually do something different and broader. My approach to the solution is also meeting people where they are. Not only the homeless people experiencing homelessness, but especially those who aren't. Something that I study a lot now, especially with all of my intertwining work in communities, is education. 
Something that we all have in common is that we've been a child before going through some sort of education system. And so what I envision, what I hope to establish one day is a chain of education centers, one by one, based within community homes. Because as has been said before, more homes are necessary. And I know that, you know, they aren't built overnight. But I know there's enough people invested in education at all levels, all accessible levels. And with that, when with education, you build the esteem of a person for them to see possibility for themselves. And so I come, I, and I don't come from a policy background. All of the women of my family, they owned daycares, they owned baking businesses. They held roles that raised families. And so with that, I would, I would call for more homes being built, but with the intention of why they're being built um, and putting education at the center of that. Yes, and I agree with most, most everything people have said up here so far. I'm, and I would add, um, from my perspective, it's not just homes. It is also community. It's um, connections. Um, that's that's really what it's about. Um, so it's whatever it is that has real community connections. Um, Reverend uh, you know, Renenbaum's his outreach from from the faith-based communities, mm -hmm. from universities. You know, we have a whole cadre of our university students who have helped um, keep places like Roots um, staffed and going. And we need more of that, the service learning and the education about it. But the other thing that I really uh, feel passionately about is more prevention. And so mm. more upstream. Um, we know that there's intergenerational homelessness and trauma that gets passed on. Um, so that if we, and not, not to say take it away from an aged person who's dying of cancer, but we need a lot more of our money going to effective programs for um, families that are really struggling um, to be good enough parents, good enough families for, for their children. So more education, more community, um, and not just building homes. Here, here. And uh, you know, I could echo everything everybody said because it's because you're because you're all right on. Um, in particular, I want to echo um, Councilmember Mosqueda. Um, again, this this is about affordable housing, right? That is what this issue is. Is what what we see is that, and and so much of this is it may seem surprising, but is is this labor market shift that we've seen happen in this in this community over the last several decades, and that what we see is that many people who are living in their vehicles are displaced. That these are people who have lived in these communities. These are our neighbors who have long time been been in parts of our communities and yet they cannot afford to live here anymore and so they use these vehicles as these forms of affordable housing to maintain a connection to the city to the jobs to the social services to their families to their medical networks to the VA all the services that they've come to rely upon for decades but they now cannot live near because they can't afford to anymore and I think we all know that all too well because we've seen it yeah, and you know, and really, what it comes down to is we we have this tendency to always try to look for a sort of a, a silver bullet solution because it's easy, right? Because if we just had a one size fits all thing, then all we got to do is invest in that and it's done. But that's simple. It's too simple. And as a matter of fact, I, I think it alienates us from the issue because we all know that we're not simple people. We're all very complicated people. We have very complicated lives and very complicated problems. And there is not one silver bullet solution that would fix all of our problems for any single one of us. And so recognizing the complexity of that connects with our own complexity, in my mind. So what we need to do is we need to think about this not just in terms of the, the long-term development of housing, though obviously we need that. It's also an immediate relief of things like parking. Things, how do you get that person off that street that connects to that long-term development? Not just, it's just the one answer. Because it needs, we need to find the way that we get the person in there and what they're getting them into. So what I think we really need, again, is this full-size, full-system-wide integration of vehicles into the housing model. Right now, when we mentioned about the, uh, the five to seven uh, uh, shelter beds that are available every night um, in the enhanced model, um, if I remember right, my members are right, the, the, uh, on average, there's about 3,500 emergency shelter beds in uh, King County. Uh, there are about 3,300 in 2018 vehicle residents in King County, and there are no parking spaces for them. 
So take, take that into consideration, or very few parking spaces. So take, take that in consideration, right? We talk about the five to seven beds that are available. There are virtually none of those uh, when it comes to parking spaces. So it really needs to be, we need to take this not as a 30 parking spaces here, 20 parking spaces here. We need to really be looking at this as a full system-wide issue. Um, and really, and it, needs to be, uh, it needs to be regional because it's, it's interjurisdictional. It's not just about one single city. If we put a law in one place, it moves people over to the next place. It needs to, we need to be working all together on this. And we really need to be focused on the, the, um, on the, the needs of, of uh, a housing first model, which is a little bit jargony uh, for those who don't know it. But really what it says is, is that not only do we, we help people sort of process through the traumas that they're experiencing when they're in public space by exiting them from public space, that once you're out of those traumatic environments, you can start to process through those things. But not just that, but it focuses on the needs of the subpopulations themselves. And it recognizes that there's a big difference between somebody who might be a senior citizen, between a youth and young adult, between someone who might be LGBTQ, or somebody who might have a felony background, or a sex offender background, or, or a family. And so by trying to put all of those people into one spot, it doesn't work, right? We know that. And it would be unconscionable to do that anyway. So we need to recognize that part of that is this distributed model, right? We need to be looking at how do we set people in our communities where they're at help them to reintegrate back into their communities and ultimately I think that there's a really exciting model out there that um, is just sort of getting some some word uh, it's something called incremental housing uh, I don't want to get into too much here but part of what it, it, it suggests is uh, people actually building out their housing themselves and investing into it and investing into the community and partnering with public and private uh, organizations to help do that and so I think that what would could be a, a exciting model would be to think about how do we leverage these pieces of private property these shelters, these homes, these vehicle homes, as they are right now, to be that transitional space into permanent housing? Where can we find places where we can help people actually be part of building out that housing so that they're part of investing in their community, that they're building that equity in their community so that they're part of that settlement so they feel invested and they, and they, they feel the love towards their community that we all do. So ultimately, that's what I would like to see, is I'd like to see us not look at this as a single, small little issue. We need to look at this as up to half of the people who are living on our street are currently un not represented or extremely underrepresented in our services, and we need to have a massive change to fix that. that that's a good segue. Um, the current system relies on data, being data-driven, having reports come. Uh, most of the people living in vehicles are not in the homeless management information system. So when we look at the numbers that have been published by the Count Us In and all the other places, that's not all the homeless people. Mm -hmm. And so that's the true uh, crime against the homeless, is we're not even representing all of them in what we say publicly and privately. So we really need to scale up our outreach, get folks into that system or somehow otherwise identify them, because we don't understand well enough um, what's going on out there, and we're reporting on bad data. I call it data-driven crazy. <laughs> and lastly, I would just like to add, just for a perspective piece, going through, entering the homeless system is not as easy as people may think. Um, it's one thing to be homeless and receive the aid and the support and the help, and don't get me wrong, it's gratefully appreciated and it opens opportunities. But it also, for some people, creates kind of a trap. Because it's very hard to then be seen as a person capable of functioning outside of the homeless system. Um, and so, yes, short-term solutions are very important, but when is the time to build that bridge to long term or at least always be thinking about it simultaneously because becoming homeless for me in ways that felt like identity loss and i'm trying to get that back as well as cope and and work in my present um and so there's so many things to keep in mind but don't detach any of this from one piece to another it's all interconnected thank you Thank you. Thank you all. Those are great responses. So before we move on, um, all the cards that everyone has, if you could get them to Maureen or to Mason, and then I will, they will, just a really great response. They they will pull the card, they will give me the cards, and then I'll read some of these questions out loud. Does that work? talk to you afterwards, too. Yeah. Of course. Anything. Anything. Just say I'm there. Oh, 
they know. I hope they know when we're ending. Yeah. <laughs> and what is Anamari doing about? Good. Thank you for that. So here's the first question that I'm going to uh, pose to you all. And again, whoever wants to respond, please feel free. So why is the press constantly referring to criminals and drugs addicts as homeless? It seems like a concerted effort to characterize homelessness as criminals, as criminal, homeless people as criminals. Um, I'll just quickly start. We, we've worked a lot with the Homeless Rights Advocacy Project out of Seattle U Law School, and they're constantly fighting this battle along with the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty uh, to take away the criminalization of the homeless. Um, built into vehicle residency is uh, that you're, in a way, a criminal. You're, you're breaking the law, you're getting tickets, they're all small f potatoes until you don't answer warrants and things like that and they escalate. Legal financial obligations become the burden on you. That's why they call it the scoff law project. Um, it, it's a negative word, it's punitive. It means you're breaking the law um, and so I think it's a constant battle. That's why one of the things I told KUOW when they asked me about this proposal that's going out to, to sweep all the really derelict RVs, I said it's a law and order response. It's not a person-centered response. So be very careful of what you read and make your own assessment. Is this person-centered or is it law and order? We want law and order. I mean, we work with the police, with parking enforcement. We want them to have the right tools as first responders, but they don't want to level, level, level the hammer on people. Most of them that I've met really shy away from that. So we need to, that's why we're working with law enforcement in many cities to try to give them better tools and they want them. And I think that's true here in Seattle as well. I know you, you want just one person per question because we got a lot of questions. Gonna, kind of, we'll, we'll okay. play by ear. Just go, see, um, we'll go, we'll go with that. Just very briefly, uh, we, have, um, ha we have talked uh, many times with Chief Carmen Best, of our police chief. And uh, she recently was talking about you know, how city council could be more, should be more supportive of our police. And she's come in, in front of our committee on public safety a number of times where Councilmember Pacheco have, and I have the opportunity to serve on. And repeatedly has said on the record and publicly to our community, being homeless is not a crime. We want to make sure people know that being homeless is not a crime. And so I asked her to come in last week and I said, I saw you on the TV. I heard you say that we need more support for our police. What can we do? How, how else can we help to make sure that people feel supported? Because you already have um, a, you know, a contract that was overdue by four years. Now people are getting paid. You have an enhanced bonus for coming in to work for the city for $10,000 more if you come from another city to try to recruit more people. What can we do to help you? What is it that you're asking for? And she said, we need more mental health services. Now that I can help with. That I can do. But being homeless is not a crime and wanting to make sure that people know that if you're sleeping outside that there's not going to be just a uh, hammer that comes down on you, that there's going to be help through mental health is something I would be happy to work on. That is something that is the true, I think, way that we can help make sure that those who need access to public health or mental health services can get some. But we have to remind folks that just sleeping outside is not a crime. It should be a crime that we're not creating enough housing for folks and that there isn't enough shelter, that is something that we, we should own. Um, but getting folks inside is, is the ultimate goal and treating them as if they were criminals should not be seen as the solution. Yeah, and if I could just add one thing to that, it's wonderfully put. Um, the, again, getting back to this issue of the safe parking um, um, programs, is that uh, the reality is, is that without a parking space, there is a little opportunities to live in a vehicle residency legally. And uh, there's this, uh, one of my, my favorite phrases on this is that we, in the absence of legal space, vehicle residents are rendered illegal, whatever they do. Mm. And so while it may be illegal, it may not be illegal to be homeless, the fact that you have to park within a very strict set of parking law renders it illegal if you, don't have, if you can't move your vehicle. And so the reality, again, it gets back to this point. The moment the vehicle is moved off the street, the moment the vehicle has an off-street parking, all of that goes away. That now you can connect that vehicle into the enhanced shelter models. You can actually get that person working into housing case management. You can get connected with that person. But if there's not that parking space, they basically are living in a, a sea of, of criminality. Great. Thank you for that. Okay, here's another one. As a case manager for homeless youth, young adults, one barrier for vehicle residents is how the housing management information system classifies them as less vulnerable than those classified as literally homeless. 
AKA someone who is not regularly couch surfed in a tent city or a vehicle. Almost all, all young adult resources through coordinated entry for all require literal homelessness to get housing opportunity like transitional housing. Thus, most folks who are couch surfing or living in a vehicle don't really get the kind of opportunity that Vince got, sometimes never in their lives because they're not considered vulnerable enough for housing, even though they are exposed to the traumas. What policy changes do you want to see that supports the work of service providers, aside from addressing the lack of funding for case managers and the expenses we have to pay out of our pockets? As a service provider, how do I advocate in general for vehicle residents, particularly families and young adults, who don't get the same prioritizations as those staying in shelter? So I, so I have to say that right off the bat, that uh, having worked in that system, that, that comment is dead on and, and is just wonderfully written. So I don't know who wrote that, but really well done. Yeah, that was a good job. You answered it. Um, uh, so the, um, in particular, um, with, uh, I'm sorry, I was even so lost on how great that comment was. So I'll, I'll, I'll let it go on, I apologize. And I, and I second that, that well, great comment. Well, I, I think we've got a bifurcation in the system only uh, times 10. Um, all kinds of different people are treated in all kinds of different ways. Um, we've got different rules for one segment, for youth, for vets, for families, for single adults. Lately, single adults have gone to the bottom of the pile. Youth have gotten a lot of attention. I'm not sure they're not off the bottom of the pile either. But we don't look at people as an individual who's homeless much anymore. We want to know what category you're in. And then we want to channel you to, to the pathway there that's going to help you, whether it's Mary's Place or youth care or for veterans. You know, what used to really alarm people when I would go out and talk about homelessness was the number of women who were waiting for a domestic violence bed. At the time, it was like 1 in 19. That would bring the room to silence. The other was that children are homeless. Like, we've helped people, seven uh, family members in a Bronco, and we see that too often. And the other one was vets. And people always stopped their opinions and talking when we brought up those categories. But I got to tell you, single adults are as vulnerable as everybody else, mm -hmm. and sometimes more so. And many of them are dealing with health issues. Sometimes it's mental health issues. Um, there's crossover co-occurring things going on. That's what we see more than anything when we bump into folks. The number of problems that they're living with right now, I say often that they're the greatest managers of their lives that I meet because they're able to stay alive uh, with all that's going on in their life because everything's working against them. So I, I just think, you know, it's not a matter of put, pitting us against each other. And that's what we're doing right now systemically. Yeah, and, and I remember what I was going to say. Is it, it, it gets back to the issue of the, of the housing first model and that we, if we need to focus this on this as the needs of the subpopulations, which is what Bill's getting at here, is that not every group of people is the same. It's not a homogenous group of people experiencing homelessness. And we need to be able to, the, one of the reasons why we have this issue of people being prioritized over each other is that there simply isn't the amount of space in the system. If you only have 20 parking spaces and you need to really prioritize who gets in those 20 parking spaces. So th that's part of the issue, is that we need to have a fully robust system of these parking spaces that actually serves the needs of the total population. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck in this issue of trying to find who has the most technical need which pits people against each other. I would also add, just for reflection, self-reflection, what pillars of support mean to each person in the room and like would you be sitting here right now if you did or didn't have those pillars of support in your life because i currently live in yate um, a transitional housing downtown and i'm grateful that i'm no longer having to you know wonder if i'm going to make it into shelter tonight but i also have but i do still have fear because uh as, as, some, as you spoke to earlier, um, the need for mental health services are necessary. Not to say anything about, you know, say anything bad about the individuals who need it, but it's the fact that we're all coexisting, needing that social support that a roof, only a roof can't give us. Mm -hmm. um, and so thinking about the social dynamics, single individuals are, I would say, as equally as vulnerable because who is there to turn to? Um, when we've been pushed out of the system, we can't access many spaces because we don't have money. Who is there to turn to? Who we, we are all looking for someone to look up to. We are all looking for a mentor or someone to just say, I'm here with you. Which is why often we, get, we stay in the groups that aren't healthy for us. You know why? Because it's another person to look at. <laughs> um, another thing to just keep in perspective in line with all everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Okay, so here's a really great question, and I think this is about hitting it right where it is. What can I do to help my friend who is living in her car? Mm. <laughs> uh, food every day. Food every day. Good nutritionally dense food every day would be a good start. I won't take up all the answers. Well, I think you have an answer at the very end of that. You're already a friend. So that's a huge part of it is, is this is a person who is living in a car, is a friend of yours. What would you do for any, any friend? Um, and, and then also just find out what the other resources are to, uh, if she doesn't know about them, um, so that it's not just up to you as a friend. Um, yeah, and, uh, I've actually had several people that, you know, you hear about that, if you want to do something, why don't you put that person in your car in your driveway? Well, I, I've done that a couple times, and it, and it hasn't always worked out well. Um, but, but generally, the reason, if it did not, it was because I did not connect the person with the professional services that are needed to move their life forward. And I would say that, if you can provide a person a space where they can get that stability, where they can start to move through the various issues and challenges they may have in their life, you can help them a lot. But the reality is, is that there are professionals in this room who do that work, but the vast majority of the people in this room are not those professionals and do not have that network of ability and the network of services and the vast institutional knowledge that's necessary to navigate a housing case management system. I mean, f that one piece right there, which is about one of maybe 10 or 15 different services and systems you'd have to navigate, the housing case management system is, is, is um, extremely difficult. It has many different applications. You have to be on top of them all the time. You have to be constantly in contact with your, your, the person you're working with. And if any of that falls apart, all of it falls apart. And so most of us don't have the wherewithal with our jobs that we do in our daily lives to be able to do that sort of dedicated work. And so I, I would say that if you can provide a person the space, that's great. But you need to also be able to connect them to the professional services that are actually going to help to move them into housing and end homelessness. And also asking yourself, if I didn't have this friend who was experiencing homelessness, where else in my life does the issue of homelessness show up? Is it, in, is it being talked about in my workspaces, in my volunteer spaces, where I socialize? Are, are my, fellow, my fellow community members already doing something and am I in those spaces? Um, because the more you provide a platform or even just plant little seeds of conversation, like that gets wheels turning. Um, and it takes much, and it takes a lot of pressure off of the person experiencing homelessness, feeling like they have to do it all by themselves. So first, I just immediately ask, what do you need? Um, sometimes, and, and you know, there's been some days where any one of us can need a hug. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, it is a healthy meal, uh, a, you know, a bowl of hot soup. Um, so ask what you need. Uh, the second thing I would say is, um, connect, and this goes to the, the point about connect someone to the right resource. Connect that person if you can and help facilitate. There's a lot of great people in this room that I know that would be helpful and impactful. But you know, even if there's not, a little Google search, a few minutes might be helpful and impactful as well. Um, in terms of the long term, I, I would say you know, um, being able to volunteer with organizations that are doing good work would be helpful too. Uh, and make a quick little plug for something the city recently did. Um, if you happen to be a homeowner, uh, we are going to be piloting, uh, the mayor's office announced a pilot for to build an ADU to, uh, to help um, low-income homeowners be able to build an ADU. So if you can, I would say in the long term, build an ADU. Just add one more thing. Um, I think all of these ideas are really good, and many of them really do focus on that individual connection that maybe you've created through trust or that past relationship. I think the other thing that you can do is to help advocate for these broader public policies that we've been talking about tonight. And if starting with a safe lot so that people don't get moved from corner to corner and not have access to that health care or that house once it becomes available because they've had to move and they don't have the benefit of being in a lot, 
advocating for that type of public policy is very helpful. Thinking through the system-like approaches that we should be changing versus sort of expecting people to pull themselves as an individual up by them, their bootstraps or hell of it, having people um, have to do one-on-one -on -one assistance. That's what we're here for, right? That's what governance is supposed to do. That's what public policy is supposed to look at, these system-wide approaches. So again, I think you just being here and hearing about the concepts, uh, short, medium, and long-term solutions that everybody's talked about is a really good first step and then advocating for the changes that you think are important and recognizing I know there's a lot of folks I've seen over the last year and a half here that these one ideas are not the only solutions and and know that we will keep working on the longer term housing know that we'll keep working on the mental health and case management that we know many of you support and know that as we do that we can also help create a, a healthier and safer Seattle because if you don't have a place to call home and the only place for you to go to the bathroom is outside or the only place for you to put your refuge is outside because you don't have a garbage disposal or you don't have a garbage pickup like most people do who are housed recognizing when we get people into safer places like um, safe parking lots and tiny homes and places where they feel safe and they have access to those services that is a helpful public policy solution and not having to feel like you have to do it one-on-one -on -one. Um, just as it relates to um, sanitation in the city and we've talked a little bit about garbage cleanup and and the immense amount of time that we talk about you know needing to pick up the garbage is real because that's not good for the health of our city absolutely um, but when we look at the number of um, bathrooms that are available for our public use we have six bathrooms across the city six places where people can potentially take a shower and use the bathroom the United Nations has said that we need around 240 bathrooms just to serve the population that's here including our tourists I went to Germany and I went on this run and I was you know having uh, this great moment where I was soaking in all the density and like the parks and everything and then I realized I had run by three trailers that had showers and bathrooms a lot of what we can do is to try to recognize that the public policy solution to much of the crisis that we see in the street requires us all saying yeah I don't love this as a short-term solution but in order to make sure that folks get off the street and feel safer and maybe so that um, we can all start feeling like we're a healthier society uh, we have to start looking at these public policy solutions and I do think that the safe parking lots that you've all come here to sort of discuss and learn about um, is a really important sort of ma um, um, well let me see micro component to a macro solution that doesn't require individual one-on-one -on -one, uh, assistance. I just have one really quick thing sure. from, a, from my nursing perspective, the back to the homeless friend. For those of you that don't already know about this resource, it's, it's absolutely essential. It's on the website. It's the Real Change um, Community Resource um, Guide that they update every single year. So for you, uh, whoever it is, um, in terms of, of having a friend who's living in her vehicle, um, of helping, if she doesn't know, knowing about that resource, it has everything, mental health, housing, and they, again, keep it up to date, and it's free, and it's on their website. And I think Graham mentioned this, uh, don't rush to be the savior by taking on the challenge of housing and taking care of someone who's homeless because you really may not know them anymore. Um, it, it really changes your will to survive, and we've just heard too many bad stories. So if you're gonna try to do something like that, do it in concert with others, like the Block Project or something that has uh, a team working on it. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but folks get desperate. I would be very desperate if I was homeless, and all my former core values would slip. And it's not a, a comment about the integrity of the people who are homeless. They're trying to survive. It is life and death. And so I've often said, oh, I'd steal bread. You're damn right I would. And, and on that note, <laughs> launch your bread. <laughs> so we are, we are running up to the close of this conversation. So I'm going to ask one final question. And, um, and, it's a, and, and then we'll, I'll give you all a chance to do a closing statement. But the question I have right now is, um, could you Heights consider using some parking spaces here for a few people or uh, families with young children to stay overnight here in their cars? And the same question for people here from congregations. I'm, I'm looking at Maureen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is that for us? 
Yeah, um, I, I think it would be great. U Heights already provides incredible services to the community. I've seen people come here for classes and dancing with kiddos and elders, and I think this is another way to serve the community. Um, one story that I just heard from from Mary's place executive director is that she's seeing more and more uh, families renting U-Hauls, long-term U-Hauls, because why? It says on the outside of those U-Hauls, $29 a day. $29 a day is a lot cheaper than the $100 or $75 if you're lucky for a hotel room. Um, and so I think it would be great if you all uh, had the ability to do that in your in your lot. And I would also say um, to the extent possible to not make it for certain um, populations because there is a huge need across the board, not just for women and children to have a place to stay, but also for the vast number of uh, single men that we hear about and the huge number of vets that we hear about that need a place to say so kudos to you for thinking about it and for all of you for thinking about other places across the city that maybe we can do this short term do you want to respond Maureen uh, thank you um, so the reason we called this panel together is because we are seriously considering um, U Heights as a safe lot and for those of you that have been around U Heights uh, Uh, but uh, we are still in our research phase because as some of you have mentioned tonight, it's not something you want to do lightly. You want to get all the experts in the room, which we've done. We want to develop relationships. We've been talking to Lehigh, we've been talking to the city, we've been talking to all our local partners at the Y and the U District Food Bank. A lot of you are here tonight, the UDP. Um, right now, our lot is what I like to call an unsafe lot. People sleep here every night, they sleep in our doorways, they set fires, they kick in windows, and they do that out of desperation. Um, and we tend to let people sleep here as long as they're gone before school starts. And so what we would like to do is have it be more regulated, have it be a pathway to housing, not just a place you go because you have nowhere else to go in the neighborhood. We have 100 spots here, and what we're learning is you're not going to fill 100 spots. Um, We've been learning from Sharon at Lehigh, you want to start really small. You want to start with five cars. We would not be supporting RVs because it's a different population. Um, we have a lot to learn around the population we might serve. Um, we, we're learning about whether families have a need. Maybe it's um, older women that have a need. We've got Elizabeth Gregory right down the street. Maybe it's youth. Maybe it's UW students. So we want to engage all of you in this conversation to help determine what this looks like. We've got 14 resident organizations, some of them are in the room. We've got 400 kids that come here every day for school, so we want to make sure that we engage everybody in this conversation. This is not something that we are going to launch overnight. Uh, we, will, we would provide bathroom facilities here, uh, including a hand washing station. It would be. Um, we would have rooms available for case management in the morning. The Y can provide showers, and then we've got a whole host of services here, including transportation. So thank you for the opportunity to share that. I, I think there's some here in the audience who are familiar with faith communities and the efforts they make. In Seattle, uh, a faith community doesn't really need a parking lot anymore. Um, that's not true in the suburbs. Uh, usually you need a number of parking spaces that coincides with the number of people who can sit in your building. But many jurisdictions have been flexing, flexible on that. We've got state legislation we're trying to put in again, especially around faith communities, to provide more safe parking outside the city, but also in the city. Um, the issue ends up being um, finding the right population, uh, I look at overnight as a good start. It, it may not be where you want to finish, though, because 24-7 is like an enhanced shelter um, where they can stay stable. But you got to start with what you can manifest in terms of your own resources and, your, and what you'll learn. Um, we helped Edmonds Unitarian start years ago. They had 75 volunteers come to the first meeting, and they had a goal of exactly doing it their way. And I said, uh, the goal you have tonight will change. I just said that to them. It'll change. And it did change, and now they're doing women, and they have 10 cars per night, and it's been successful. And through other partners in Snohomish County, they're able to move into housing. But they've been stable, they can get jobs, and it's 24-7. So you've got to start with what you can manage. And you're going to learn. Uh, you've got to be ready to learn when you start something. Um, so I just encourage that... Um, you know, I kind of like the idea, uh, we've talked about people parking in driveways, but we found out <laughs> RVs, you can't do it. I'm not sure about living in a car in a driveway. Maybe you could do that. But uh, 
we need to begin exploring more of the remedies um, that are possible, and I think faith communities, uh, we companion them the way we do individuals. We walk with them through this and, and let them stay in conversation so we can help them overcome hurdles. Uh, because most um, cities, and I'll just say this, really don't want the vehicles on their streets. Um, they just don't. And I can say that's true about Seattle, especially, which has the most vehicles. But even cities like Bellevue and Shoreline and Renton and other places don't want people living on the streets. So the more options we can create off the street, and that also brings us into the private sector. Um, we've often talked about businesses. You know, instead of getting a watchdog, get an RV, keep it in the parking lot. Um, you know, as sort of a security measure. But those are the things we stop short of. So I just want to encourage that the more we learn and continue learning and uh, don't do anything alone. So. Yeah. One, one, I, last, one last comment. I want to echo that too. That, and that, that I think that, uh, I, I hope that there is an opportunity to have a safe parking place here. And that, um, that in particular, that there are a tremendous amount of students at the University of Washington who could definitely benefit from that and who are obviously right here at the U and it seems like it's a good fit. Um, I think that, uh, but you know, one of the things that it highlights, and I appreciate Reverend Bill, you pointing this out, is uh, the the ability for faith-based communities to lean in and be part of this. But um, in in LA, uh, they have an interesting model where they've actually done a lot more of partnering of private and public partnerships, and it's been a really kind of fascinating idea of looking at where are there diamond parking lots that aren't used at night? What about the what about the big uh, parking lot right next to City Hall? Mm -hmm. Right. What about our hospitals? What about fire stations? What about police stations? The funny, what about UW? The funny thing is, is that we actually have parking spaces all throughout our communities, and it really takes a sort of a reframing of us to think about how can we use that parking space? Because these parking spaces lie fallow at night all the time, and they can be used as that. These are, these are resources that can be used to actually connect people into housing. And I think that ultimately, this has an opportunity to be part of a much larger network and to be part of opening a larger discussion about how do we meet the needs of this total population, here being for one group and that, that we can help them in particular, and part of a larger network that helps the total uh, uh, community of people living in their vehicles across our, our county. So thank you all, that was great. So we have a few more minutes, so I'm gonna let you all do one last close-up comment. I think in that we've had a lot of conversation about a huge number of issues, policy, structure, um, friendship, uh, trauma, um, you know, uh, unresolved conflict, a whole bunch of things, right? And politics. So if you will, can you kind of encapsulate what you got from this in, from your own personal experience and what's the message that you want to give to the, to the, to this group as they embark on this conversation in the, in the university district? That, that, that just spun my mind too much. So I'll just say, I'll say something fairly simple off of, off of this, if that's all right. And that is, um, I'm speaking as a university professor um, right now. Um, I have tenure and they can't take it away from me unless I have moral turpitude, which I do not plan to do anytime soon. But <laughs> University of Washington, I've had five or six students, nursing students, we're talking basic nursing students, who have come to me um, over the past um, two years to disclose homelessness issues because they know that I'm very out about my, my own experience with homelessness. And um, we do not have sufficient resources at the University of Washington. We're the largest state-funded university um, in Washington. What are, you know, why aren't we doing more about um, housing and food insecurity of our own students. I've also had students who um, have perhaps done service learning at Roots, then they know about that, that, that resource, they become homeless, they go there, or at 45th Street Homeless Youth Clinic, um, where I worked for many years, would become patients. But I, I just am really upset with, uh, with what University of Washington is not doing. We had a, a large survey of all three campuses, which was about a year and a half ago. The results were sat upon um, until they went through many different layers of approval by the university and were partially released um, this past spring right before graduation. So I would just say, I mean, I love University, university Heights. It, it does true community. Um, I would just really hope that you don't take um, University of Washington students um, and, and, and let Anna Mari off the hook. <laughs>
well said, and I didn't have to say it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, you know, although I was born Catholic, I was raised in a Baptist home, and obviously with my name being Abel, my parents were very religious. Um, and uh, my mother, used to just, you know, she always at the end of the night would make us say our prayers and, and uh, ask us at the end, you know, and he said unto him, am I my brother's keeper? And tell, tell me the story of Abel. Um, and the answer was always yes. That we had a moral obligation to look out for one another. Um, so with that, you know, I will say in my short time and, and responsibility that, that I've inherited, um, you know, I, I will do what I can, Maureen, to be a, as much of, of an advocate and supporter as I can. Um, but I also get to witness how much of a dedicated servant leader uh, Councilmember Mosqueda is. Um, and so to that, she, she knows how I, that I admire her greatly. And, and, um, but I also think it's, it's you know, we, we're lucky in Seattle to have such dedicated uh, elected leadership. Um, I think we can do more to encourage our county and our state and our federal government to do more because it's truly, truly going to be in partnership that I think we do more and be more impactful for more people. So. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to encourage you uh, to use something that uh, Paolo Freire uh, inaugurated called Praxis, which is reflection, which I often call education, and then action, and to always pair them together. And don't do it just alone. Find a small group of people who that you will do it with, or like the Ballard Task Force, or the U District Task Force. Find a place where other people are looking at this, and then talk and get educated. I mean, like Seattle U has several uh, law student hidden in plain sight was one about vehicle residency, living at the intersections. There's ways that you can get better educated. It has information there about San Diego, Santa Barbara, Eugene, places that have done this. But so you get a, a view of the bigger picture, but then act so that you get an experience of what's going on. Meet people like this woman right here and, and Graham or others um, who can continue that journey of et being educated and, and acting. Um, that comes down onto each one of us. Uh, and and I used to have a pastor who said, the bottom line is nothing will change without you. And uh, it's true. So I just think that that's your call, is to get better educated, because it's a lot of dis disinformation out there. You know, after all, Seattle is dying. And, um, and thank but, you for that. <laughs> but there's counter voices that really paint a true picture of reality. That's right. I th think, actually, Seattle is a caring city. So prove it. Thank you. And with that, um, I just want to remind you all, my name is Tyresha Jenkins. I'm 23 years old. And I'm speaking to you all, to especially those who are maybe sitting in your seats wondering, how do I leave this night? What do I do next? This feels heavy. <laughs> I invite you all to actually programming here that will unveil in the fall, building mosaics of home. You may have seen the flyers outside when you sign in. I'm co-creating this with you Heights for specifically issues like this. Community talkbacks entwined with creating art, but mostly how do we gather people, how do we gather resource within our own backyards and talk about how we can organize on even smaller scales? Because a lot of us don't have access to policy, which is important and should be supported. But that's why we can do that work even here. How do we get our young people to vote? How do we build these intergenerational conversations and make sure that the, small, the short term, medium term, and long term are all having smooth transitions? Creating platforms for, for pe people to talk, be heard, to meet. You can meet more people like me. <laughs> but really, about creating pl platforms and seeing that every single person is capable of doing something. And it's all about just finding that connection point. Thank you. Well, I don't know how to follow that. That was great. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that. Uh, so, so again, you know, I reiterate that what we're seeing is, is that these vehicles are being used as a forms of affordable housing because they're within this persistent constraints on environments, right? On, on, on people not seeing an opportunity to move into housing. And so they're seeing this vehicle as their preferred long-term form of shelter. 
And I, I, when I started looking at this years ago and in, in, through an anthropological, my, my degree is in anthropology, and so I looking at, started through this lens, one of the things was looking at other examples of this. And what we see is that this, this is something that's been going on in sort of Western society for, for a long time, I mean, at least 500,000 years, 500 or 1,000 years, not 500,000 years. Um, and, um, and, and in particular, uh, there's communities in, in England, in Ireland, uh, there's uh, people known as the Roma people, the Irish travelers, the British tinkers. Uh, that have been living in RVs uh, or caravans uh, for since there have been RVs and have been living on the sides of the road since they were displaced in their own communities 500 years ago. And what we see is if we look at that history, I bring that, that historical perspective to think about if those groups with their persistent social isolation within their own communities actually became so distinct from their own communities that they actually got a genetic test done that showed that they were different from the Irish around them, which is really kind of startling to think about how much that social isolation can be so um, extreme that it actually separates people off from their neighbors. And ultimately, if we do not find a way to include these neighbors into our communities, these, these inclusive pathways that actually help people get back in, into housing and into settlement, that we are going to be running into, into a very similar issue. That we're having this increasing social isolation, social, social isolation of our neighbors on our public streets. Uh, they're often very treated as an oppositional threat. They're seen as a sort of nomadic threat. And really what I want to impress upon us is that this is not an example of nomadism, as we might think, is particularly when you see an RV, but that really that these are people who are settling. People who are settling in our communities, they're from our communities often, they're displaced, and they're trying to find these as forms of settlement. And so really we, I think we need to shift the way we see that and not see these vehicles as this example of a nomadic threat, but really as an example of people trying to find settlement within their own communities. And that's where I think we can really lead in and we can make a difference there. We can find ways that how do we actually find those places and how do we make those partnerships to connect people with the long-term systems that can actually end homelessness for all. Thank you. Well, I, I just don't have much to add to that except for to say thank you for being willing to engage in this discussion. Thank you to you Heights for uh, thinking about how to use your space and I know that many in the faith community have already opened up both their parking lots and their uh, buildings to creating additional space and we should be doing the same. At the, at the City of Seattle we've opened our own hall um, upstairs and downstairs to create a, a place for people to sleep. Again, that's mats on the floor. People do have to line up and leave in the morning and uh, they line up in the evening when I'm leaving. They're already outside. Um, and to think about how we all can maybe play a role in opening the spaces that we do have as we work on building additional enhanced shelter and as we work on building additional housing, each of these components are necessary and I'll continue to use the uh, recipe analogy. Um, there is no just one element that we can look to to solve the crisis. Um, and I, I know that uh, we all want to, and that's why we're here. We don't like seeing people live outside. We don't like living outside ourselves for those who've shared your lived experience of living without um, a home. We want to be able to be part of the solution. And I'm not promising this one solution of a parking lot alone will solve homelessness by any means, but it is a critically important service to help save lives. When I hear the term Seattle is dying, we have to recognize 200 people actually did die in Seattle last year. That's who's dying, folks who are living outside. So let's all be part of the solution. A safe lot is part of the solution. Enhanced shelters are part. And then let's all keep working on that additional housing. Um, and I really appreciate you guys being here and the questions that were asked. I know there was a million, um, but we're happy to continue to engage with you as you think about these options. And we have this conversation across the city. So thank you all for opening your ears and your eyes and your mind and your ideas to how we get more folks inside. Thank you all. So I, I really want to point out that thank you for everybody for listening and actively doing that. That's really important. Thank you so much. And I think I'll, I will close by saying um, one of the things that we talk about at Roots all the time is, and I say constantly, and as a person who, who lived 10 years on the streets, I really do get this conversation. And I want to say very clearly that while it was not my fault, and while it was not all of our faults 
there's a huge level of responsibility, and that to me is the significant difference. I'm not to blame, but I definitely need to take some responsibility and take action. So I offer that to you and to all of you. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you for being here, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you all.